to another GCLS virtual event. You're here for Carolina Fence Gardening. This has been graciously presented by Greater Greenville Master Gardeners. We're so appreciative that they've been able to work with us and to present such a wide variety of topics for all of you budding gardeners out there. If you don't already have a library card, please do come visit us at any of our many locations. And you can get a library card that gives you access to our downloadables, databases, and of course, physical materials. So you wanna visit us soon. If you're interested in gardening, you're probably also interested in getting seeds for your garden. We have a permanent seed library located at the Berea branch, and that is open every time that the library is open. If you've got a library card, you can just show that, and then you can get 10 packets of seeds per visit. So you don't wanna miss on, out on that. Okay, so thank you all for joining us, and please give a welcome to Donna Hopkins with Greater Greenville Master Gardeners. Thank you, Donna. Hi, it's wonderful to be here. I'm not official. I'm not used to wearing my badge in, the, in my own home, so I don't have it on. But I am a Greater Greenville Master Gardener. I have been since 2008. Um, being a Master Gardener is a really wonderful program, even if you're not interested in um, doing big things, you learn a lot. Uh, volunteering is an opportunity to, to give back. That is one of the bases for the Master Gardeners is that it is a giving back program because we're um, a go between, between the professionals and the lay gardener. And then if we volunteer, we're giving back for the, for the knowledge we were given. It is a paid program though. I always recommend it to anyone. It is online now. So as well as in the classroom, they're supposed to have the first classroom in January. If you're interested, you might want to investigate. Um, you can go to GGMGA online and there's on our site, there's information about the class. It could be full, there may still be places open. It'll give you both the online and in-person information. I learned more from those I think I'm supposed to be teaching something to than I do from other people than from like classes, because everybody has something they care about a lot. So they have more ideas. They've caught hold of a little magic something. They've got, you know, so everybody can share and it's a real treat to have that opportunity to learn from others. <clears throat> State Fence Gardens is a program that was developed to try to encourage gardeners, homeowners, to look toward their states as an inspiration for a sense of pride, a way to reflect your love of gardening through your, the love of your state. Um, not all states use a fence, many do, not but not all. The Carolina Fence Garden uses the split rail fence. The reason for that is because split rail fences were the very first fences once the settlers of South Carolina had moved inland enough to be having farms and wanting to show where they lived, um, protect gardens, protect livestock, as well as keep livestock at home. And in the beginning, they simply picked up fallen trees and branches and propped them together to make a rail. And there's a lot of information about split rails. You can make a split rail in any way you like. You can simply, uh, like when you're cleaning up your yard, you can use those limbs that fall that are large enough to prop against each other 
and make a fence. You can build a fence. The main premise is that by split rail, even though those early ones were just fallen limbs, then once they were clearing land and everything, they did split those rails to make their fences and the trees to make the rails, excuse me. And so that's, you know, there are a lot of people who do use the split rail and it makes it smaller. If you used an entire um, trunk of trees for every part of your fence, then it would be a very tall fence. Um, it can be anything from simply three uh, rails laid together, um, three on one side, three on the other side and woven together to make a corner, that's a fence. It can be a fence that covers one side of your garden. It can be a 10 foot fence. The wonderful part of the Carolina Fence Garden is it can be as simple or as complicated as, as you want it to be. The Carolina Fence Garden can be in a garden like mine. I live in the middle of 50 acres and we maintain about two acres. To someone who lives in a patio home or an apartment and all the space they have is a little outside, whatever that thing is, you step out of the door. I am sorry, the brain, I told Rachel, my brain loved to lose words. So, <clears throat> y'all know but anyway so that's the beauty of this garden and you start with that split rail and then you begin to implement the different state symbols the first one I usually talk about is the flag because that's a way to determine do you just want a small regular flag on say a, a 10 foot pole, do you want a, like a house flag that hangs um, vertically rather than horizontally that you just have um, as part of your garden? Or do you want a great big flag to really let everybody know that you have got your flag and if they take notice, they'll see your fence and garden. So that's a place to start. I'm sure many of you are familiar with, if not every one of you are familiar with our state flag. It is the palmetto tree and on in white on the field of blue. And then there's great debate over just what that white other white object is. But for tonight's discussion, we'll just call it a crescent with it. Um, it's one of the most recognizable state flags in our country, which makes me very proud. Then the next thing I try to think about is the state tree. Now, I don't recommend to anyone in the upstate that they plant a palmetto tree. The reason being you could plant it having spent hundreds of dollars for it. And it live for years and years. You could plant it and it not survive through one season. They are not really, really happy in the upstate because we never know our weather. And sometimes they just cannot handle our winters. But you can represent the tree in many ways. You can simply say, well, there's a palmetto tree on my flag and leave it at that. Later, you'll see my husband um, made me a stylized palmetto tree that's about a foot tall. He simply took a piece of like quarter inch, maybe it's not a half inch. I think it's quarter inch plywood. He just took his little saw and he just made ziggy zaggy things around the top, put it on a 
pole <laughs> trunk and put a base on it. And that's my tree. He got that idea from seeing on a lot of things that you can buy that kind of stylized palmetto tree. You can find flags that are palmetto trees. There are many ways you can represent the palmetto tree. The state flower is the um, Carolina jasmine. And it is something to be considered when you do your fence as well, because it is a vine and it will spread without care. And it desperately needs your fence to live on because they don't like growing on the ground. They like to go up. Um, it's not a doesn't have tendrils if any for anyone who's not familiar with the Carolina jasmine, but it so it does. It's not like it's going to latch on, say like clematis, but it will find its way up. Like mine is at the end of my home, and we have siding, vertical siding, and invariably a little piece will grow right at the bottom edge. And then as it grows, it just follows the path of the siding. And when there's a little tiny opening, it'll come through there. And all of a sudden I have Carolina jasmine growing out of the side of my home. So I really have to take care of it and make certain that it doesn't get totally out of whack. <clears throat> I was telling Rachel while we were making certain we were all set up that the last three weeks, four weeks, my yellow jasmine has gone crazy. It's like every tendril has grown four feet. Yellow jasmine bloom anywhere from late December through into late February. They do have a lovely fragrance and a lovely blossom. Um, they don't have to be in the ground. I have one that when I do an in-person program, I carry it with me. I put gave it a little um, kind of teepee trellis thing that I wrap it around and it all together, it's about three feet tall. Um, one year it decided to bloom at the right time for when my presentation was. Invariably though, it doesn't. So, but they are a delightful plant and it is a lovely flower that is representative of our state and it will grow anywhere in our state. Um, I'm sure there's some places it might grow better than others. Like I know in the upstate, it grows prolifically. There may be parts of the state it doesn't grow as well, but I've personally witnessed seeing it all over the state. <clears throat> the next state symbol that you might want to consider is the state butterfly. And the reason for that is it is the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. It's a lovely black, yellow, I should start with yellow because that's the predominant color, black, red and blue butterfly. It's host plant, there are two. One is the, um, I just had it, hold on. Sweet Bay Magnolia, I'm so sorry. And the other is um, the, I did not write this one down and I apologize. Poplar tree. <clears throat> um, it loves those two trees. So if you wanted to plant the host plant, to encourage the butterfly to come, you would need to consider where you put your fence guard. So <clears throat> um, the, if you're not familiar with the Sweet Bay Magnolia, it is not as big as just our Southern Magnolias. It doesn't grow as large and the leaves aren't as large, the blossoms aren't as large but it has an even more lovely fragrance 
than just our Southern Magnolias do. And it's a beautiful tree. It's not as um, big around. <clears throat> I would say it's probably max six, seven feet across where my magno other magnolia tree is probably 40 feet across. So it does fit in quite well. And sometimes it's a better use than the poplar because the poplar trees are tremendous. And what happens is you don't know that the butterflies are very happy with you with your poplar tree because they're all the way at the top where the blossoms are. And when they're 50 feet off the ground, you can't see them. All you can sit, see is that the top of your tree is dancing and you can't figure out why. Well, that's the butterflies as they're laying their eggs. The other thing you need to consider for the state butterfly is that you have nectar plants for them. Almost, they love almost any nectar plant, but all of our many common nectar plants, the cone flowers, uh, zinnias, lantana, they love all of those. And so it's a good selection to choose from to see what you would like to include in your garden. You don't have to include any of them. It's just, if you want to be look at, look, able to look out and see your state garden with everything doing its thing, then it'd be wonderful to be able to see those butterflies come to get those nectar plants. The next um, item that I think of is the state bird, the Carolina wren. Most of you are probably familiar with the Carolina wren, but if you're not, it is a little brown bird about three inches. And there are two things that distinguish it from other uh, wrens or even sparrows because some of the wrens are very, very similar to some of the sparrows. The Carolina wren has a white eyebrow that is quite distinctive. And it also has a tail that stands up just like this. The only time I've ever seen a wren with its tail down is when it was being chased by another bird. And, but otherwise when they're hopping around on my bird feeders and singing and carrying on, that tail is always just straight up, letting me know it's very happy. You can put a, a wren box on your fence. Um, that's a wonderful way to bring them to your garden and to, hopefully be able to go out and hear those little babies in their box. Um, you can also, you can include a bird feeder. You, you know, the, all of this is the more you do, the more these state symbols that are alive are going to come to you and allow you to enjoy them as being a part of your garden. Another one to consider is the state stone. Now, not very many people know that we even have a state stone or what it is, but it's the Winsboro Blue Granite. It was mined for a long, long time in Winsboro, South Carolina, which is north of Columbia. It has not been mined in a good many years. You can still see the mine though, because the State Railroad Museum is in the mine because they use their track and they've, um, that museum has maintained it. You can see the blue granite laying around. There are some places that you can buy some. Um, you can, um, was told you can go online to find some that you can buy. I had the privilege of having a friend who volunteers almost every weekend at the State Railroad Museum, bring me some. The only thing you can get anymore, they used to do everything 
that they do with granite, but they did a lot of stepping stones. But now all you can, all you can get are these little three or four inch cubes that are where they drill into the granite to that they've prepared to take out of the mine and they put some kind of like something into these holes where they drill out these or cut out these cubes and he brought me two cubes but they won't uh, that was a long time ago and they won't allow them to do that anymore so I feel very very special that I got mine as a gift. The state wildflower is a plant that a lot of people don't realize is a native and a lot of people don't realize is not a bad guy and that's goldenrod. Many people think that it causes them hay fever, but that's not what the culprit is. Goldenrod is a tall yellow blossomed plant. The blossom looks like it's a big blossom, but it's many T90 little blossoms all together that kind of look like fingers. I'm sure many of you are familiar with goldenrod. Um, but through my years with the Master Gardeners, I've encountered many people who thought that it was the culprit for um, allergies and that's ragweed, which is a totally different looking um, plant. Um, I did not realize and still until I started doing this presentation that goldenrod was a native plant. There are many cultivars to goldenrod, but this the native, but there, you know, we do have the one you see on the side of the road is a native plant. There's a state grass. It's called Indian grass. It is um, not showy. It is not a large grass like pompous grass. It is around, if any of you are familiar with lemongrass, it's about that size. It has a plume, a fairly small, um, maybe five inches. Um, and its plume is more like zebra grass. It's not a big ploofy thing um, like pompous grass, but it is a very attractive grass. And when sown in groups, it is very attractive but they don't get really, really big. So that's the beauty of it being our state grass and using it in this garden is it doesn't take a lot of space. If it was a pompous grass, you'd need a lot of space. And you'd have to really, really think about where you were going to plant it because as pompous grass grows, it can take over. The state amphibian. For those who didn't know we had one, I was surprised. It's the spotted salamander. Now, I don't, I have water on my property, but I don't have um, water that would attract a salamander anywhere near my fence garden. But I can still do things that would attract them to temporarily make their way into my garden. And that is by having those things that would interest bugs and other creatures that the salamanders eat into my garden, like the ones who want to eat those flowers I've talked about. And the different things that even grass anywhere near there's things in the grass that the salamanders eat so everything you do with your garden can potentially attract those other things now if i live in a neighborhood that doesn't have water is a fair distance from water then my odds of attracting a salamander are about slim to nil but one never knows. So everything we do has potential. But all of the other things, the well-known state symbols 
we can definitely put into our garden. And even with our, um, the state bird, I have a tiny little Carolina wren. Well, in fact, I have two of them. The first one, you can't buy an artificial Carolina wren. You can buy all kinds of other little birds. And so I found a little one. I think it was a sparrow or something. And I painted him brown with a little dab of yellow around his throat and under his tail. And I put his white eyebrows on and I first stuck a stake up him. And then I took his tail that just kind of stuck out straight and I bent it straight up and I made my own Carolina wren. So when I'm doing something that I want a presentation that I want to take my things, then I can take my Carolina wren with me. Um, my other one is that I had told a friend that I was looking for a small Carolina wren that I could include, include with my presentations who would not look out of proportion to my fence and my other things. And she found it, me one in a gift shop. It's a little tiny metal one and he's flat of course, and he, but he's the size of a wren. And so I treasure him because he was a special gift for me to use in my presentation. I forgot a um, state symbol that some people think are marvelous, some people think are yucky, and some people downright hate due to their some of their habits. And that's the praying mantis. The um, praying mantis that lives in our area is a little brown one that's about that big. When I was hunt hunting me a praying mantis online, all I could find was a green one that's about that big, but I use him anyway, because you know, he's still a praying mantis. Um, I was trying to look to make certain that I have not failed to cover any of the different, um, not necessarily well-known state symbols, but more frequently discussed state symbols. There's all kinds of state symbols, one for just about everything in the book. So, um, there aren't any um, pitfalls to doing a Carolina fence garden. You can't do it wrong. You can only do it right because you're doing it in a manner that makes you happy. I will tell a funny story about, because it just came to mind about when I decided to talk about the Carolina fence garden as a presentation for the master gardeners. I asked my husband if he would make me a split rail fence. And I said, you know, about this big, just something I can put in a bag with my other things and carry around with me and demonstrate. He came in the day before my presentation and he said, I've got your fence ready, where do you want it? And I said, well, I have my bag ready. I'll just put it in there. He said, bag, what are you talking about? I said, I told you I wanted to put it in my bag. And he said, no, come outside. And I went out and my fence is three feet tall and three feet wide. And it has a base on it, so it stands up. It is made of cedar, so it will never ever go anywhere. So every time I do my presentation, I get my work out and usually have to help ask for help wherever I end up for my presentation. So in these days of COVID, since I wasn't using it, I just decided instead of him building me another fence, that's what I would do my fence garden on. And then I'll convince him to make me a bag size fence garden. Now I made a picture of my Carolina fence garden that I want to show you, but we have to just keep our fingers crossed that this works. Okay. I um, was trying to get everything from the tip of the flag to my Winsboro blue granite in the picture, 
So there are some things that you have to look very closely at, but they're there. There's my flag. There is my stylized palmetto tree. There's my um, bird box. There's my fence peeking out behind all of that Carolina jasmine that has gone crazy. And at the very bottom, you can see those cubes of the Winsburg blue granite. Now that lovely blossom on your right is my hydrangea who would not move no matter how hard I tried to pull her out of the way while I was making my picture. So you just get to see, and that's my late bloom. All the others are beginning to dry out and fade. And so she just decided she'd show up soon. On top of the box, you can see to the left, this, you can see the butterfly. You can definitely see, most see the yellow and then the black on the edges and there's these little blue spots. The red spots are so tiny, even uh, pulled in, you can't tell it. It is sitting on a magnolia blossom. On the right of that is my wren with his little chest sticking out proudly and his little tails perked up there, but you can't really tell it. Above him on the back of the box is my praying mantis, my big, my big green giant back there. And then, and of course my <clears throat> um, flag is the perfect topper to work my way right back to from the beginning. And there's my mower in the back. You can see I did work hard to be able to be here with you tonight. So, I guess, Rachel, at this time, we can take questions. Okay. If there perfect. are any. Yes. Does anyone have any questions? You can, again, you can put it um, in the chat or you can unmute yourself now. I know I learned a lot. I did not know that we had a state amphibian. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was new to me. <laughs> Let's see any other questions from anyone? I hope that a lot of you are considering doing this yourselves. All right, our first question is, can the jessamine grow in shady areas or does it need full sun? Well, they tend to do better in full sun as do many vines, but I can testify to the fact that mine only gets morning sun and it's very, very happy. And so that's, and it is like once the sun gets to like nine o'clock, 8.30, nine o'clock, it's in the sun and it is there until 12 or 12.30. 12 um, but I have seen them under trees, but they probably do not bloom as well if they don't get any sun where the morning sun allows mine to bloom. Okay, great. Any other questions? I always tell people take advantage of the master gardener when they're available to you. <laughs> it's a wonderful opportunity to ask some of your burning questions. And Rachel, if there are those who have questions that aren't related to the Carolina Fence Garden, I have no problem saying that I don't know. Great. So I won't make up anything, but they could ask about other things if there's no one that has other questions about the presentation. Perfect. All right. So ask away any gardening question. <laughs> I mean, we might as well take advantage of it. We all like to talk gardening. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. So some of you are thinking about things for the winter. We do have another class coming up about the joys of winter gardening. That's going to be next month too. So be sure to check that one out as well. Get some great tips for keeping your garden alive. All right. My plants aren't flourishing in this clay soil. Can I add something to the soil? It's a great question. <laughs> oh, you're on mute, Donna.
Is that better? Perfect. Oh, okay. I didn't, I must have touched, sorry. Um, I have to say, I have a wonderful husband and he's weed eating, but if that's bothering anybody, I can only apologize. He probably doesn't. So I hope it's not bothering anybody. I'm just so very grateful. Um, okay, back to the soil. If you have not done a soil test through Clemson, that's your first step. Um, many people who, especially who move to the upstate to not, and are totally unfamiliar with our soil, they all have the misgivings that our soil has no value all on its own, but that's not true. Our soil, most of the time, has, is almost perfect. When I had my soil test done, right now, I think I had to add some potassium. I was expecting to have to add truckloads of everything, you know. So that's the first step. And then once you get your soil test and you know that there are things you specifically need to add, or maybe you, you find out that you are just perfect the way it is. The problem with our clay soil is the nutrients moving. It's kind of like being a traffic jam in Atlanta. Can't go anywhere because the soil is so compacted. So you can add things to it to break it up. If you mulch, you're already starting because over time that mulch begins to not only break down itself, but because it's laying on that hard clay, it begins to break it up as well. But that takes a long time. And personally, I want to get my coneflower in the ground today, not in 10 years, maybe, you know. So what you do is you dig your hole and you have a bucket with you. Like, um, unless you're planting a tree, a five gallon bucket is plenty. And then you add things like dried manure, which you can buy, it's called black cow at Home Depot or any of the other, or wherever you care to buy your gardening products. That's one brand. You can buy um, all kinds of natural element, you know, things, composting, organic things. You can add peat. You can, you know, all of those things to put into that, that you're going to put into that soil to help. You take part of the soil that you took out of your hole, put it in that bucket and take those other things and then take your shovel and stir it up in the bucket. It's easiest if you kind of do a little of this, a little of that, a little of that, so you're not, uh, you know, having to mix the whole thing up. You've already done part of the mixing. Before you plant, take your shovel and job it up and down into the bottom of the hole and then slice the sides of the hole. Because if you don't, you have simply made a bucket in the ground. You could put enough water in it to fill it up and go back the next morning, it would be sitting there. Because like I said, not only can those nutrients not move, neither can the water. So, and it's, it's not that hard. You just have to take it and just, instead of leaving that hole, the sides and the bottom, perfect. Just job into it and slice into it and break it up enough. And then you begin to plant your plant. Dig it deeper, as always, than your plant. Add some of the soil you've mixed up. Put your plant in, finish planting it. And what's left, you can just hold over for the next plant. You'll be ahead of yourself a little bit. <clears throat> and this way, you eventually do most of your garden. I have a huge garden because of where I live. And there's no way I could treat all of that one time. So you can tell exactly where I have planted more and where I planted less because the more the soil is better because it through the years of me amending the, uh, my soil, 
it has moved into the spots that I didn't dig into and begun to break down that red clay. So, yes, you're absolutely right. You can add to it. So great question. I did put in the link in the chat for the page from Clemson on your soil test. Yes. Um, and then we also have a couple of videos on soil health uh, that we did with Greenville County Soil and Water Conservation District. So you can also check those out on that's right that playlist. Yes. Since right. you men mentioned, wait, just one second. Since you mentioned Clemson, <clears throat> they have um, home and garden information. It's called HGIC and you just click on, you put in what you're interested in, soil hydrangeas, petunias, it doesn't matter. And almost everything you can think of, there's a page to tell you. They are printable. You can save them to your laptop or you know desktop, whatever. Whichever way you'd like to use that information, it is a wonderful, wonderful resource that we have. All right, thank you for sharing that. I'll put the link to that in the chat as well. Thank you. Yes, we have another question asking, is it time to bring tropical plants indoor? Well, <clears throat> I'm trying to put off bring, bringing in mine. I don't have anything big, I, but I have house plants and most house plants are tropicals. <clears throat> and so I'm telling myself they have to come in by next week because we have been known to have a freeze or at least enough of a frost to kill those tropicals by the end of October. So regretfully, because I love them being outside. They're so happy. Yes. That's Plus nice. I take up a lot of space in my garage when I move in my containers. <laughs> That's our problem as well. I'm like, our house is overrun suddenly with plants during the winter time. <laughs> All right, let's see. Do we have any other questions? People have found the resources very useful that you've mentioned. Thank you for sharing those. Wait just another minute. If, if there aren't any other questions, that's all right. Yes, we've got some thanks. People have enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Donna, for that. All right. Well, I appreciate all of you coming uh, to this wonderful virtual event, Carolina Fence Gardening. I hope you've all learned something here tonight. I know I have. We're so appreciative, of course, to Greater Greenville Master Gardeners for sharing their time and talent with us. We're so fortunate that they've been able to come and present on all of these great topics. I've heard such wonderful feedback that people are using this advice uh, at their homes and in their gardens all along. So that's wonderful. If you're interested in more virtual events, and like I say, the next Master Gardener event that's next month, make sure to check out our event calendar. That's at greenvillelibrary.org slash events. Uh, if you're watching the recording, of course, all of the links are in this video description. So you can be sure to check that out there. As always, if you have any questions or follow up about these presentations, be sure to email explore at greenvillelibrary.org and be able to get those answers for you. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and sign up for our e-newsletter, and that way you can always be ready to attend one of these events. Thank you so much to Donna, and again to Greater Greenville Master Gardeners. We appreciate you so much. Thank, thank you, Rachel, and thank everybody for joining in. Yes, thank you all, and y'all have a wonderful evening.